Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell hit out at Pete Buttigieg's performance as Transportation Secretary during a floor speech yesterday. Let's watch. Unfortunately, this leadership has cut a sharp contrast with the Biden administration's Secretary of Transportation. Even amidst a catalog of crises on his watch, from this and other recent train derailments to the meltdown in air travel back during the holiday season, Secretary Buttigieg has seemed more interested in pursuing press coverage for woke initiatives and climate nonsense than in attending to basic elements of his day job. Later, during an appearance on CNN, Buttigieg responded to McConnell with this. He is the, the caucus leader in the Senate. He could be a partner to us right now in making sure that there are fewer rail disasters in the future. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the, rail, uh, the freight rail industry has wielded a lot of power here in Washington. I would love to see Leader McConnell join us in standing up to them. This has got to be a let them fight moment for you. Yeah, look, everybody's right. It is perfectly fair to ding Buttigieg over the disaster over the holidays with the airlines. Mm -hmm. It is perfectly fair to ding him over his delayed responsiveness over the East Palestine disaster. It is also completely true that Republican Party has been subject to enormous lobbying under the Trump administration to deregulate in the ways that I talked about in my radar. And that Mitch McConnell and a lot of the Republicans, I think, who are making legitimate criticisms about how the Democrats are handling it in this moment are not actually bringing solutions to the foreground. And my critique of Pete Buttigieg and his response there would be to say, be more specific. Present, you know, the, the Biden administration used to say, here's some legislation that would fix this problem. Are you going to sign on to it or not? Are you going to whip people for this or not? Be specific about what actually happened under the Trump administration. What was Mitch McConnell's role in some of the negotiating around the deregulations that happened around the brake systems and whether or not certain mm -hmm. kind of cars are considered to, to be, you know, sufficiently hazardous to have to have come under certain kind of safety regulations. Be specific, because standing there saying, well, come and work with me when you haven't presented the audience, the, the general public, a working plan does seem like a little bit of a cope. Mm. Well, as Buttigieg finds himself buried in scandal, the future of the former mayor's political ambitions appear to be hanging in the balance. That's what co-host of The Five on Fox News, Dana Perino, thinks anyway. I also feel that Mayor Pete must feel like, why did I take this job? Why did I want this job? Because I think his political ambitions are slowly dwindling right before his eyes. Yeah, I think that's fair. <laughs> I've raised that point a number of times. Uh, he seems frustrated, and I mean, I'm not trying to psychoanalyze him, but I imagine he's frustrated <laughs> because uh, I, maybe he didn't expect that going into this job. I have no idea how he felt, obviously, about getting stuck with this. Maybe he would have preferred something that is less work or doesn't have, even at, I guess during a normal year, still has a number of, of accidents and disasters. Yeah, let's remember how Pete Buttigieg got here. Pete Buttigieg was the best performing centrist political candidate mm -hmm. in the Democratic Party primary, not named Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think? And what's centrist about him? Just what's not centrist about him? What progressive or populist mm -hmm. policy does he support? He doesn't support Medicare for all. Medicare for all. Who want it? Doesn't that he? wasn't Medicare for all? No. And he knows it. And that's why so many progressives reserve a special ire for Pete Buttigieg because he cosplayed as a progressive. So many liberals think that if you're young, if you're not white, if you're not straight, that these identity factors default mean that you're progressive. It's why people, um, uh, who's my favorite congressman up in uh, New York, who I always I always block his name. There are an, any number of people who just happen to be young and black or Afro-Latino or gay or whatever. Richie Torres. Richie Torres, right. He, he gets talked about as a progressive when there's literally absolutely nothing about his policy agenda or political proclivities that will lead you to believe Pete that. Pete Buttigieg was kind of hawkish too, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he was wine cave Buttigieg. But all of that being said, because he was very skillful at presenting himself as all things to all people, um, he was doing very well in the Democratic pri primary. And remember, Joe Biden was not. Joe Biden didn't win a state or even, I think, come in higher than third in a state until South Carolina. So there was he was a leading the polls. Sure. He yeah. was leading the, you know, he was, uh, by February 2020. I always 2020, thought he was eventually going to win. Yeah, he, he led the polls the entire race. By February 2020, he and Bernie were neck and neck. And in those first contests, remember, it was, it was a Bernie mm -hmm. extravaganza. Now, Pete 
tied ostensibly with Bernie. There was all of that weird Michigas that went down and with the Iowa voting system. Pete claimed victory, I would argue prematurely. Bernie played victory. Obviously, I have my bias. I worked for the Bernie Sanders campaign. But it was Pete and Bernie, Pete and Bernie, mostly Bernie in those first three states, with Joe Biden coming in far behind. So it became clear they learned the lesson of the Republican Party in 2016, that you, if you don't consolidate behind the establishment Jed or Marco Rubio or whatever, you're going to end up with Trump. And Bernie was that outsider player right. like Trump. So what it was crucial that Pete in particular dropped out. And because Pete was the most successful of the crew, the Amy Klobuchar and everybody who dropped out all in tandem to consolidate behind Joe Biden, because Pete Buttigieg was the most successful, he had the most to lose. He, he was the one that felt mm -hmm. like, oh, I can maybe stay in this and become the actual president of the United States of America. So he had to be offered something significant. And apparently he didn't want this job. And he was chagrined. I forget. I think it was an ambassadorship or something that he actually preferred. But now he's in this position, and it's become a real catch-22 for him. Yeah, because it's going to hinder, absolutely, I think, his future political ambitions, which I, I imagine he still harbors. I've mentioned a couple times that I, I expect him to try to run for Michigan's uh, Senate seat. So mm -hmm. Debbie Stabenow is a current Democratic senator from the state of Michigan. And uh, he has taken up residency, or during, did during the pandemic, in the state of Michigan. So he could run for that seat um, when it comes up, which I think it's in. I think it's this, it's coming up in 2024. Mm. So that will be very interesting. Uh, there's actually going to be a number of people getting into that. I, I'm from Michigan, so I, I follow the state's politics a little more closely than other states. Um, there's there's going to be there's already a, a state. Uh, a state rep, um, I think she's my state rep, who's going to run. There's going to be a lot of people. It's going to be interesting. So interesting what do you make of Buttigieg's chances in that path to the White House? They've been substantially damaged by by East Palestine, by Southwest, and et cetera. Et cetera. Yeah, I think he's, um, I, I think he's, it's not that he was ever going to be like popular among Republicans, but you're, you're right. To say he's a good political salesman. Mm -hmm. He does. Uh, unless you're very discerning or very ideological, he seems like smart, reasonable, good right, communicator. Says all the right things to all the right people. Um, so you could see him doing well among independents, among moderates, uh, but not really, but not alienating, alienating actually liberal progressive Democrats. Alien the left, sure, but yeah, you know and, what I mean? And I also think that he suffers from a little bit of that um, Elizabeth Warren problem, where the media loved her. Mm -hmm. She was in many ways, and Pete was very much in media creation. He sprung out of nowhere uh, to be on the cover of every magazine in the world in 2018, 2019. Um, but the media and their kind of the elite credentialed people who run the media loved him because they're the kind of people who think that what we really need is more McKinsey analysts to figure out the world, that there's just too many stupid people doing too many important things. Mm -hmm. We need to clean house and get some Ivy League McKinsey guy to come and downsize America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Basically, merger and acquisition our way through the, the population. And while there's an elite conservative part of the country that also agrees with that approach to the world, working class people who see in, in Pete Buttigieg and saw in figures like Mitt Romney, the guy that fired their dad, don't like that kind of approach. And I always was concerned about whether or not the thing that captured the attention of the media was actually going to translate into a broader um, voting base. And for Elizabeth Warren, we saw that it didn't. We saw that she came third place in her home state in the Democratic primary. And although the, the polls liked her and the media liked her, her campaign was never able to get off the ground. Yeah, I think Elizabeth Warren, even more than Mayor Pete, was a media creator. Was, uh, her exact kind of persona and politics and, and everything about her was so beloved by a kind of progressive, super on Twitter journalist in D.C. and New York that they were really like overestimating her chances all the way along. I'm like, you're telling me this because every, you know everyone on and my Twitter feed loves her, but mm -hmm. like the I'm sorry, Biden is like the still fairly popular former vice president who's widely known to all of America, mm -hmm. and you're saying you think she's going to like easily take this guy down? And, and she I gotta didn't say, come close. a lot of the discourse around you know remember the snake emoji stuff where Elizabeth Warren's campaign yes. was complaining. No, I would have never their... shared one of those. <laughs> But all of their tweets and social media posts had snake emojis written under them. And there was this feeling that they were getting bombarded by by Bernie bros and these people who were. Yeah. But that was never, the media never 
tried to interrogate whether or not there, there was an authentic movement behind someone like Bernie. We didn't need paid bots and all of this stuff no. to work for us. There were people who felt passionately about what Bernie had to offer because he's been fighting hard for it for 40 years at times when it was not politically expedient for him to do so. And Elizabeth Warren and some of the policy positions that she took and, and pivoted to, especially at the end of her campaign when she started doing the attacks on Bernie. Well, the people who were all and, obsessed, right, the people who were all obsessed in 2016, the Clinton people, all who were all obsessed with the idea that Bernie's followers were uniquely sexist and harassing, all of those people became Warren people. Yes. Um, and I, I remember paying attention to that. That was, because obviously I don't, I don't share Bernie's politics very much, but I remember looking at that and going, what are they talking about with this harassment thing? Yeah, and nobody believed it, and that was the end of her, yeah. but not before uh, taking a donation from an undisclosed billionaire to stay through till Stupor Tuesday, really putting the final nail in mm -hmm. the coffin of progressive hopes and dreams. Well, we'll see how Mayor Pete fails in whatever he pursues. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how Fair. he fares. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. All right, tomorrow on Rising, we'll be back right here to bring you more coverage that we know you love. <laughs> Be sure to like, share, and subscribe Heart. so you never miss any content. And for those of you who like to listen while I'm a go, we're now available anywhere you listen to podcasts. See you later. Bye-bye.